Hi everyone, happy Thursday. We are gonna be finishing up chapter seven, the Bogart in the wardrobe. Um, just as a quick recap, um, Malfoy had returned to class after the whole hippogriff incident. Um, and in potions class, it seemed as though he was being a bit dramatic, but Professor Snape was as usual favoring him and picking on the Gryffindors. And so as a result, it was just a not good class altogether. So on their way to their next class, Ron and Harry have lost Hermione and they're kind of confused. And this is where we, right before where we left off. One minute you were right behind us, the next moment you were back at the bottom of the stairs again. What, Hermione? Looks slightly confused. Oh, I had to go back for something. Oh no! A seam had split on Hermione's bag. Harry wasn't surprised. He could see that it was crammed with at least a dozen large and heavy books. Why are you carrying all these around with you, Ron asked her. You know how many subjects I'm taking, said Hermione breathlessly. Couldn't hold these for, for me, could you? But Ron was turning over the books she handed him, looking at the covers. You haven't got any of these subjects today. It's only Defense Against the Dark Arts this afternoon. <gasps> oh yes, said Hermione, Hermione vaguely but she packed all the books back into her bag just the same. I hope there's something good for lunch. I'm starving, she added, and she marched off toward the Great Hall. Do you get the feeling Hermione's not telling us something, Ron asked Harry, and that's where we left off. I'm getting kind of a suspicious feeling about Hermione for sure, but I'm not quite certain what it could be about. Professor Lupin wasn't there when they arrived at his first Defense Against the Dark Arts lesson, and so I'm very curious to get to know Professor Lupin. Um, the last two Defense Against the Dark Arts teachers have been crazy, so I'm wondering if he's going to be completely different or similar. They all sat down, took out their books, quills and parchment, and were talking when he finally entered the room. Lupin smiled vaguely and placed his tatty old briefcase on the teacher's desk. He was as shabby as ever, but looked healthier than he had on the train, as though he'd had a few good square meals. Good afternoon, he said. Would you please put all your book bags, books back in your bags? Today's will be a practical lesson. You will need only your wands. A few curious looks were exchanged as the class put away their books. They had never had a practical defense against the dark arts before. Unless you counted the memorable class last year when their old teacher had brought a cage full of pixies to class and set them loose. I remember that. Right then, said Professor Lupin, when everyone was ready, if you'd follow me. Puzzled but interested, the class got to its feet and followed Professor Lupin out of the classroom. He led them along the deserted corridor and around a corner where the first thing they saw was Peeves the poltergeist, who was floating upside down in midair and stuffing the nearest keyhole with chewing gum. Peeves didn't look up until Professor Lupin was two feet away. Then he wiggled his curly-toed feet and broke into song. Looney Loopy Lupin, Peeves sang. Looney Loopy Lupin, Looney Loopy Lupin. Rude and unmanageable as he always was, Peeves usually showed some respect toward the teachers. Everyone looked quickly at Professor Lupin to see how he would take this, and to their surprise, he was still smiling. I'd take that gum out of the keyhole if I were you, Peeves, he said pleasantly. Mr. Filch won't be able to get it into his brooms. Filch was the Hogwarts caretaker, a bad-tempered, failed wizard who waged a constant war against the students and indeed Peeves. However, Peeves paid no attention to Professor Lupin's word, except to blow a loud, wet raspberry. Professor Lupin gave a small sigh and took out his wand. This is a useful little spell, he told the class over his shoulder. Please watch closely. He raised the wand to shoulder height and said, Wadiwasi, and pointed it at Peeves. With the force of a bullet, the wad of chewing gum shot out of the keyhole and straight down Peeves's left nostril. He whirled upright and zoomed away cursing. Cool, sir, said Dean Thomas in amazement. Thank you, Dean, said Professor Lupin, putting his wand away again. Shall we proceed? They set off again. The class looking at shabby Professor Lupin with increased respect. He led them down a second corridor and stopped right outside the staff room door. Inside, please, said Professor Lupin, opening it and standing back. The staff room, a long paneled room full of old mismatched chairs, was empty except for one teacher. Professor Snape 
was sitting in a low armchair and he looked around as the class filed in. His eyes were glittering and there was a nasty sneer playing around his mouth. As Professor Lupin came in and made to close the door behind him, Snape said, leave it to Lupin. I'd rather not witness this. He got to his feet and strode past the class, his black robes billowing behind him. At the doorway, he turned on his heel and said, Possibly no one's warned you, Lupin, but this class contains Neville Longbottom. I would advise you not to entrust him with anything difficult, not unless Miss Granger is hissing instructions in his ear. Neville went scarlet. Harry glared at Snape. It was bad enough that he bullied Neville in his own classes, let alone doing it in front of other teachers. Professor Lupin had raised his eyebrows. I was hoping that Neville would assist me with the first stage of the operation, he said, and I am sure he will perform it admirably. Neville's face went, if possible, even redder. Snape's lip curled before he left, shutting the door with a snap. Now then, said Professor Lupin, beckoning the class toward the end of the room, where there was nothing but an old wardrobe where the teachers kept their spare robes. As Professor Lupin went to stand next to it, the wardrobe gave a sudden wobble, banging off the wall. Nothing to worry about, said Professor Lupin calmly, because a few people had jumped backward in alarm. There's a Bogart in there. Most people seemed to feel that this was something to worry about. Neville gave Professor Lupin a look of pure terror, and Seamus Finnegan's eyes now eyed the now rattling doorknob apprehensively. Bogart's like dark enclosed spaces, said Professor Lupin wardrobes, the gap beneath beds, the cupboards under sinks. I once met one that had lodged itself in a grandfather clock. This one moved in yesterday afternoon and I have asked the headmaster if the staff would leave it to give me and my third years some practice. So the first question we must ask ourselves is, what is a Bogart? Hermione put her hand up. It's a shapeshifter, she said. It can take the shape of whatever it thinks will frighten us most. Couldn't have put it better myself, said Professor Lupin, as Hermione glowed. So the Bogart sitting in the darkness within has not yet assumed a form. He doesn't know yet what will frighten the person on the other side of the door. Nobody knows what a Bogart looks like when he's alone. But when I let him out, he will immediately become whatever each of us most fears. Oh, isn't that terrible? This means, said Professor Lupin, choosing to ignore Neville's small sputter of terror, that we have a huge advantage over the Bogart before we begin. Before we begin, have you spotted it, Harry? Trying to answer a question with Hermione next to him, hobbling up and down on the balls of her feet with her hand in the air was very off-putting. But Harry had to go. Uh, because there are so many of us, it won't know what shape it should be. Precisely, said Professor Lupin, and Hermione put her hand down, looking a little disappointed. It's always best to have company when you're dealing with a Bogart. He becomes confused. What should he become, a headless corpse or a flesh-eating slug? I once saw a Bogart make that very mistake, tried to frighten two people at once and turn himself into half a slug. Not remotely frightening. Oh, chilly boy. The charm that repels a Bogart is simple, yet it requires force of mind, you see. The thing that really finishes a Bogart is laughter. What you need to do is force it to assume a shape that you find amusing. We will practice the charm without wands first. After me, please. Ridiculous. Ridiculous, said the class together. Good, said Professor Lupin, very good. But that was the easy part, I'm afraid. You see, the word alone is not enough. And this is where you come in, Neville. The wardrobe shook again, though not as much as Neville, who walked forward as though he were headed for the gallows. Right, Neville, said Professor Lupin. First things first, what would you say is the thing that frightens you the most in the world? Neville's lips moved, but no noise came out. I didn't catch that, Neville. Sorry, said Professor Lupin cheerfully. Neville looked around rather wildly as though begging someone to help him, then said in barely more than a whisper, Professor Snape. Nearly everyone laughed. Even Neville grinned apologetically. Professor Lupin, however, looked thoughtful. Professor Snape, hmm. Neville, I believe you live with your grandmother. Uh, yes, said Neville nervously, but I don't want the Bogart to turn into her either. 
no, no, no. You misunderstand me, said Professor Lupin, now smiling. I wonder, could you tell us what sort of clothes your grandmother usually wears? Neville looked startled, but said, well, always the same hat, a tall one with a stuffed vulture on top, and a long dress, green, normally, and sometimes a fox fur scarf. And a handbag, prompted Professor Lupin. A big red one, said Neville. Right then, said Professor Lupin. Can you picture those clothes very clearly, Neville? Can you see them in your mind's eye? Yes, said Neville, uncertainly, plainly wondering what was coming next. When the Bogart bursts out of this wardrobe, Neville, and sees you, it will assume the form of Professor Snape, said Lupin, and you will raise your wand thus and cry, ridiculous, and concentrate hard on your grandmother's clothes. If all goes well, Professor Bogart, Snape, will be forced into that vulture-topped hat and that green dress with the big red handbag. There was a great shout of laughter. The wardrobe wobbled more violently. If Neville's successful, the Bogart is likely to shift his attention to each of us in turn, said Professor Lupin. I would like all of you to take a moment now to think of the thing that scares you most and imagine how you might force it to look comical. The room went quiet. Harry thought, what scared him the most in the world? His first thought was Lord Voldemort. Voldemort returned to full strength, but before he'd even started to plan a possible counterattack on a Bogart Voldemort, a horrible image came floating to the surface of his mind. A rotting, glistening hand slithering back beneath a black cloak, a long, rattling breath from an unseen mouth. Then a cold so penetrating, it felt like drowning. Harry shivered, then looked around, hoping no one had noticed. Many people had their eyes shut tight. Ron was muttering to himself, take its legs off. Harry was sure he knew what that was about. Ron's greatest fear was spiders. Everyone ready, said Professor Lupin. Harry felt a lurch of fear. He wasn't ready. How could you make a Dementor less frightening? But he didn't want to ask for more time. Everyone else was nodding and rolling up their sleeves. Neville. We're going to back away, said Professor Lupin. Let you have a clear field, all right. I'll call the next person forward. Everyone back now so Neville can get a clear shot. They all retreated, backed against the walls, leaving Neville alone beside the wardrobe. He looked pale and frightened, but he had pushed up the sleeves of his robes and was holding his wand ready. On the count of three, Neville, said Professor Lupin, who was pointing his own wand at the handle of the wardrobe. One, two, Three, now. A jet of sparks shot from the end of Professor Lupin's wand and hit the doorknob. The wardrobe burst open. Hook-nosed and menacing Professor Snape stepped out, his eyes flashing at Neville. Neville backed away, his wand up, mouthing wordlessly. Snape was bearing down upon him, reaching inside his robes. R -r ridiculous squeaked Neville. There was a noise like a whip crack. Snape stumbled. He was wearing a long lace trimmed dress and a towering hat topped with a moth eaten vulture, and he was swinging a huge crimson handbag. There was a roar of laughter. The Bogart paused, confused, and Professor Lupin shouted, Pavardi, forward! Pavardi walked forward, her face set. Snape rounded on her. There was another crack, and where he had stood was a blood stained bandaged mummy. Its sightless face was turned to Pravardi and it began to walk toward her very slowly, dragging its feet, its stiff arms rising. Ridiculous, cried Pravardi. A bandage unraveled at the mummy's feet. It became entangled, fell face forward, and its head rolled off. Seamus, roared Professor Lupin. Seamus started past Pravardi. Crack, where the mummy had been, was a woman with floor-length black hair and a skeletal green-tinged face. A banshee. She opened her mouth wide and an unearthly sound filled the room, a long wailing shriek that made the hair on Harry's head stand on end. Ridiculous, shouted Seamus. The banshee made a rasping noise and clutched her throat. Her voice was gone. Crack, the banshee turned into a rat, which chased its tail in a circle, then crack became a rattlesnake, which slithered and writhed before crack becoming a single bloody eyeball. It's confused, shouted Lupin. We're getting there, Dean. Dean hurried forward. Crack, the eyeball became a, several, a severed hand, which flipped over and began to creep along the floor like a crab. 
Fucking ridiculous, yelled Dean. There was a snap and the hand was trapped in a mouse trap. Excellent, Ron, you next. Ron leaped forward, crack. Quite a few people screamed. A giant spider, six feet tall and covered in hair, was advancing on Ron, clicking its pinchers menacingly. For a moment, Harry thought Ron had frozen. Then, ridiculous, bellowed Ron, and the spider legs vanished. It rolled over and over. Lavender Brown squealed and ran out of its way, and it came to a halt at Harry's feet. He raised his wand ready, but... Here, shouted Professor Lupin, suddenly hurrying forward. Crack! The legless spider had vanished. For a second, everyone looked wildly around to see where it was. Then they saw a silvery white orb hanging in the air in front of Lupin, who said ridiculous, almost lazily. Crack! Forward, Neville, and finish him off, said Lupin, as the Bogart landed on the floor as a cockroach. Crack! Snape was back. This time, Neville changed forward, looking determined. Charged forward, looking determined. Ridiculous, he shouted, and they had a split second's view of Snape in his lacy dress before Neville let out a great ha <laughs> of laughter and the Bogart exploded, burst into a thousand tiny wisps of smoke, and was gone. Excellent, cried Professor Lupin as the class broke into applause. Excellent, Neville. Well done, everyone. Let me see. Five points to Gryffindor for every person to tackle the Bogart. Ten for Neville because he did it twice. And five each to Hermione and Harry. But I didn't do anything, said Harry. You and Hermione answered my questions correctly at the start of the class, Harry, Lupin said lightly. Very well, everyone. An excellent lesson. Homework, kindly read the chapters on Bogarts and summarize it for me to be handed in on Monday. That will be all. Talking excitedly, the class left the staff room. Harry, however, wasn't feeling cheerful. Professor Lupin had deliberately stopped him from tackling the Bogart. Why? Was it because he'd seen Harry collapse on the train and thought he wasn't up to it? Had he thought Harry would pass out again? But no one else seemed to have noticed anything. Did you see me take that banshee? shouted Seamus. And the hand, said Dean, waving his own around. And Snape in that hat. And my mummy. I wonder why Professor Lupin's frightened of crystal balls, said Lavender thoughtfully. That was the best defense against the dark arts lesson we've ever had, wasn't it, said Ron excitedly as they made their way back to the classroom to get their bags. He seems like a very good teacher, said Hermione approvingly, but I wish I could have turned, could have had a turn with the Bogart. What would have been for you, said Ron snickering, a piece of homework that only got nine out of ten? That's a good one, Ron. And that's the end of chapter seven. Um, so I am, first of all, super impressed with Professor Lupin. I think um, that he's a character that I'm going to really like. Uh, secondly, I am also wondering, probably as well as you are, why he didn't give Harry a turn with the Bogart. I think it was more purposeful that he didn't give Harry a turn than Hermione. Like maybe he just didn't want Harry to be the only one left out and so decided to leave her out as well. Um, I'm, I'm worried that he thinks that he might not be able to um, defeat the Bogart if it turns into a Dementor. I'm not really sure. But I'm sure of one thing, that in the future chapters we will find out the answer to that. In the meantime, chapter 8 is what we will start tomorrow. It's called flight of the fat lady. So I'm thinking the only fat lady in these books so far has been the one at the portrait hole to get into the Gryffindor um, dormitories. Maybe there's another one or maybe it's the same one. All I know is I can't wait to read with you. And so tomorrow I hope that despite the fact that we were supposed to get rain, there are some at least field day activities that you can complete and that you just enjoy a day of making new memories in a new kind of field day virtually to all my Friendship Valley friends. And to everyone else, uh, have just a great Thursday afternoon. And I can't wait to read with you again tomorrow on Friday. See you then. Bye.